Hello, Barry. Hello, Bobby. Hello, Sanel. Hello. So, this is the second episode that we do in English uh, for Small Talk, our English version of um, Get Weather, our podcast in Greek. Uh, and today we have uh, Sane Goslinda, I'll, I'll say it in the easy pronunciation, uh, <laughs> yeah. with us, uh, who's uh, an HR specialist at Martha Messi. Do I say it correctly? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so, before we start, would you like to share uh, some of the things that you did in the past, you know, some, some history, so yeah. we can uh, take it from there? Yeah, so my background, um, I guess I will start with the professional side of things, yeah. so that's, uh, that, that makes sense. Um, so actually I started my, let's say, my degree in sports management, something okay. completely different. And that was because I really enjoyed sports mm-hmm. uh, when I was younger and also probably I just didn't have much insight of what all things you could study at university. Um, and so um, I decided that, you know, after university I wanted to not work yet, I wanted to go a bit further with studies. I um, studied in the Netherlands and then moved to Australia and did my master's there. Nice. Um, yes, it was very nice. Um, really enjoyed it there as well and then decided um, after having been there for five years working there at the university teaching, I decided that I would go to uh, Berlin. And um, yeah, started there, thought how will I ever start my job because I don't speak any German but I speak Dutch so you know, there's a little similarity there. Mm-hmm. I think it's similar to us, but not similar to like Dutch and German people. I think uh, it's not as easy to communicate. I, I, I have no idea. I don't know why it's Dutch or... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, look, when I, when I arrived, I thought, okay, I probably understand like 80%. When I actually learned to speak German, it's probably 30%. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a bit different. Okay. Um, but yeah, I went there and I thought to myself, you know, first of all, I need to get a job. And I was mm-hmm. not really, you know, I didn't really care about whatever the job was as much I just want I felt like I need to work you know I don't want to use all my savings I need to get a job and get going with it um so I started to you know apply for jobs that I thought at least this is something I can do and from Mm -hmm. there on I could move further so I applied for a lot of uh, Dutch speaking jobs in particular which would be your typical call center which you see here in Greece a lot as well um, and while I was sitting here in an interview, the lady told me like, oh, if you spoke German, I would have hired you for our HR position. And I thought to myself, you know what, this is ridiculous. Why am I doing this? Um, so I thought, to, you know, I thought, let me just apply for some HR positions as well and see what comes up. I don't speak German, the language, but, you know, I can always see if, if there's ways around that. There's something called Google Translate that might help me a lot. And it did. <laughs> Um, And so I decided to apply at a startup, or multiple. I got rejected a billion times. Um, Learned a lot from those rejections as well. Sat in interviews that were a total embarrassment as well. (laughs) Um, But you know, you learn from all of those experiences. And I think that, um, especially in my job today, being in HR, that has helped me a lot to understand also people that I interview perhaps today. So I finally got a job at a small startup, 25 people, called Sociomantic Labs. Yeah, it was really, really nice. It was a fantastic startup. I mean, the the culture was really lovely. Um, What we did was real-time bidding, um, which was great. Um, For ads or...? Yeah, Mm -hmm. so for ads, yeah. Um, And, um, you know, our founders, we had three founders, two who were very Mm tech-focused, one who was more business-focused. It was a really great, successful Mm -hmm. mix, I would say, as well. Um, and so we decided that, you know, we, we were one of the first companies to use actually the D language, the first commercial language to, or commercial company to use the D language, which later on some other companies, uh, um, also adopted, but it made it interesting for developers because, Hey, here we are using a language that not many other companies are using, but that they are interested in. So, um, so yeah, we hired a lot of C++ engineers that then became also the engineers and um, were very successful. Two years later, we were sold to a company called nice. Tanhambi mm-hmm. in the US <clears throat> um, that's focused on analytics. And um, yeah, then I also left uh, right after that um, because I was headhunted by a company called Wayfair, which is a big mm-hmm. e-commerce yeah. player yeah. Um, in the US at the time. In Europe, they were very small. Again, 25 people in Berlin. Um, and my job was to evolve the HR department um, for Europe, so to speak. So I stayed here for about five and a half years. 
was fantastic. Um, really loved it, built out uh, my team there um, across many different locations, but also not just offices, also warehouses, call centers, etc. And when we left, we were probably in Europe about two and a half thousand. So uh, it was really a scale up. Uh, no. drastic, mm-hmm. drastic That's a thousand times more? Or, or? Yeah, 25, yeah. 20, well, 2500, yeah. 25, oh, right? so 100, 100 times more, yeah. Um, but the company, mind you, was about 20,000, so yes, okay. uh, globally 20,000. We then expanded also to Asia, and um, yeah, it was, it was really, really great. It was a big learning curve for me as well, um, going from a small startup where we grew from 25 to 250, to now go from 25 to 2500, so to speak. Um, yeah, so that's where I went. Then after that, my husband, who is from Athens, this is usually where the aha moment comes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, this is the connection to Athens. Um, you know, he, he, he and I were talking about going back to Athens. Um, reason being that I'm actually from a very small island in the Caribbean called St. Martin, which is mm. half Dutch, half French. Um, so, you know, um, as we were talking about earlier today, talking about the weather was also not something we did there, but in Berlin a lot. Um, so we uh, decided that, you know, we would try to make our move to, mm-hmm. to Athens. Um, and by doing that, trying to work for a remote company. Um, my husband is an engineer himself, software um, front end. And um, I decided, okay, I will look for something more remote or maybe something local in mm-hmm. Athens itself. And at that time, I got an opportunity to work. Um, well, I got two offers: one which was with Coca Cola here in Athens, mm-hmm. um, and the other one which was with um, a company called Hajar. Okay. So um, Hajar was a is one of the companies I would say um, that was remote first before mm-hmm. and remote only before mm-hmm. anybody was remote. Um, and they had a fantastic working culture, you know, they had really a people-centric culture, they still have a people-centric culture. Um, they were really a company that, you know, where the leaders I felt were um, also inspiring and, and people that I felt um, I could really work with. And um, yeah, so then I changed and went to Hajar. We spent time, my husband and I spent time here, going back and forth between Berlin and Athens. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, after that, uh, we decided, I, or we decided, no, uh, we got pregnant. <laughs> and um, after, or during my pregnancy, I decided that um, probably after that, after my maternity leave, I would not come back to Hajar. Um, one of the reasons also being that, you know, if I really wanted to embed myself in the community here, it would be really important to do something locally. And okay. um, with Hajar being fully remote, um, you know, that's much more difficult to, to integrate, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and I, I wanted to be with a team that I felt was more of a local team. Okay. So, um, so I went to maternity leave. Our son Feather was born, uh, who is now twenty-two months, <laughs> and um, and then you know the pandemic obviously happened to everybody. Now mm-hmm. everybody's going remote or has to go somewhat semi-remote. Um, so things have been changing quite a lot uh, in the world. And uh, then I decided, you know, after six months of leave, time to get back to work. <laughs> I really want to work. Want to do something. Um, and my husband, Joros, um, said to me, hey, why don't you talk to George from, from mm-hmm. Marathon? I can make an intro. And he had met them at the tech event they organized in Berlin. And um, I said, OK, let me talk to, to George. And well, the rest is pretty much history. And uh, they offered me a job. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, yes. So um, uh, yeah. So what, what it is like to be an HR person for a venture capital company? Because usually yeah. you, you would see HR people in, you know, in companies that want to hire people, but usually venture capitalists are, you know, smaller yeah. teams. Yeah, great question, because it's, it's very different, uh, to be honest, right? So um, I think the things that I love is that I get to work with so many different teams. Um, on the counter side, of course, they're not my team, right? Mm-hmm. So I always need to make sure I'm striking the right balance to not come in too heavy, but to be more of a consultant versus um, um, 
yeah, the, the, the manager of the team, so to speak, because that is what I'm... So, so you work with the teams of the companies that Martin invests in? Yeah, right? so okay. it can be their own HR team, it could be that I'm helping them hire their HR team, um, it could be that I'm working with the founders or others in the, in, in the company. Um, so yeah, there's very different projects and um, definitely the difference is also that I work from a very granular perspective mm -hmm. to a much more broader per mm. strategic pers perspective as well. So I would do anything from you know recruiting, uh, helping them to hire certain positions, versus um, doing things that looking at you know what is their current organizational structure, mm. or thinking about you know if we're going for uh, a funding round, you know um, what is kind of their headcount needing to look like over the next eighteen months. How do we plan that out? Things like that. So. Yeah, all different topics. <laughs> so um, uh, I understand this is quite different from what you used to do. Uh, yeah. So how do you like it? I mean, it's very different uh, now. Okay, you're part of the team, but uh, you work more as a consultant, as you said. Yeah. So how do you like the difference between hiring a team and going like 100% on that team and, and consulting yeah. many different teams? Yeah, I think... Um, what I like the most, or what I like a lot about it, is that you have so many different projects and you have different companies. So they're either at different stages, funding mm -hmm. stages, for example, or they um, they are um, just the, the the kind of the culture of the team or the you know the the, the pathway that the team is trying to mm -hmm. to go through is very different. So I think what I really like is that you get to wear really many different hats and every time you need to put on a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and why I like that is because, you know, I feel that life is something where you need to always keep learning. Mm -hmm. um, and if you feel that you're not really learning, that that's probably the time that you get bored or that you kind of think, mm -hmm. oh, I need to change or that, you know, uh, for me, that then excitement is kind of gone. Like I need to feel that I'm I'm seeing new things, that I'm seeing results. That and this is why I think this is pretty exciting because you see pretty directly mm -hmm. your results, right? You see when you are or are not helping a team um, to move in the direction that they want to move into. So for me, this is very exciting, and um, and for me, it's also a perfect match because before I. Uh, reached out to Marathon, I was thinking, you know, maybe I will do some consulting mm -hmm. with startups. Um, I would really like that. I love the startup world. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's what I've always been in and what I enjoy. Um, but then this is a perfect match because now I also have a team and, and people that I can spar ideas with mm -hmm. uh, at Marathon mm -hmm. itself, who are maybe not HR professionals themselves, but also who have a great, a great thought on, you know, how uh, founders think, for example, or you know what they see as as a good future, or um, yeah, trying to mix our skill sets. So it's it's really nice uh, to work in this thing. Yeah, it's it's actually really, really interesting because usually you see VCs mostly focusing on the business and the tech side because I mean. I'm talking yeah. about tech VCs because that's what uh, <laughs> I'm uh, more familiar with, but. Uh, you don't often see how they're going to grow into the team, but at the end of the day, the team is what matters. So it's really uh, interesting to see that uh, you also approach the, the people perspective when you either, uh, I suppose you also, uh, how to say, when you go for a new fund round, or you say, do you want to fund this specific company? Yeah. So that's really interesting to have all this, also this perspective in the adjustment and how we're going to help this company go to the next level because, uh, Five people is easy, 15 people is okay, but growing thing is immensely uh, more yeah. harder than that. Yeah, you know, I will tell you that before I, um, so when I reached out to George, um, um, I asked him the question, you know, have you thought of having HR in the VC? And he said yes. And to be truthful, I thought that, yeah, maybe he's You're just lying. saying that. <laughs> But then once I was hired and we were, you know, I was going through the materials and kind of looking through their, like their business plans from the previous years, they had actually written in the business plan okay. that they wanted to hire an HR person. So, um, you know, that gave me also, I think, a lot of confidence that, they, you know, that obviously, and now that I know George, I know he would never bullshit me or <laughs> bullshit anyone, yeah. but just, he says what he, what he thinks. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think now knowing that it just, 
build or gave me the confidence as well. Okay, they're really supportive. They really want this, and they, you know, they they see the value of having this in the in the VC. And you can see that more and more VCs are having it, but I think not always at our stage or the, at the mm-hmm. size that we are. Right. Mm-hmm. So we're we're not a very large VC, obviously. But at the same time, it's great to see that you know what George and Panos have also or continuously are saying to us as well that we need to be helping to build companies, right? And to be to be fair with you, you know what made me also say yes towards them of joining is that they really said to me like you know we really want to support Greek founders. For us, it's very fo- much also about building companies, but also building community. Um, and again, that community part was extremely important for mm-hmm. me, mixing the mm-hmm. business and the community side of things. So, uh, yeah, it's been really good. Um, I'd like to ask a question because you you told us that you're working also with teams that already have an HR department. Yes. How does that work? I mean, what's the relationship between the HR person of the venture capital yeah. and the HR person of the company? Yeah, um, I think it depends a little bit on. Um, let's say also the seniority of that person. Mm-hmm. So we have one of our companies, Causally, that has mm-hmm. a very senior VP, um, Dan, who's had more than 25 years of experience in this field, um, certainly is more senior than myself, I would say. Um, but you know, there with someone like this, it's, it's more about, at times, sharing thoughts, sharing ideas, or if there's something that I've come across that I think could be helpful to them, or a, you know, profile of someone, for example, that I share those things. Or, you know, um, with Causally, they were working on getting their private health insurance set up in, in Greece. I said, hey, let me help you with that. You mm-hmm. know, I can, I can push that to, through. So, um, whereas with other companies, you know, I have a really great HR, uh, head of HR at Hack the Box, for example. Mm-hmm. Panos, who, you know, is super keen, a super wants to learn so many new things, you know, is not afraid to ask me questions, mm-hmm. to kind of pick my brain on, on, hey, how would you go about this? Or what would you do in this situation? Um, and those, you know, I, I love both relationships. On the one, I can spar ideas on, on you mm-hmm. know, or, or can help out where, where, you know, that's helpful for the team. On the other side, I can also help somebody um, to think about, you know, what their next steps, how they're going to tackle something strategically and, um, you know, what to help them find the best answer and solution for their team. So it's really nice to, to work, yeah, well, I would say in both kind of uh, directions. So. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so you have great experience with many different companies, mostly based in Greece, because that's where a marathon is investing. Uh, I think you also know a lot about other companies like uh, startups or other companies in Greece and also you have uh, the experience from Berlin working both uh, in very large companies like uh, Wafer or uh, Hotjar where it's, it was a remote first company. Um, so how do you uh, compare those uh, like the, the situations in, in Greece or uh, remotely or in Berlin? Uh, and yeah. all these different countries and setups. Yeah, so what area would you like me to focus on? Okay, so many things I can uh, uh, I would mostly uh, like to understand how does the Greek local ecosystem compare to the Berlin one and how do these compare to a remote first ecosystem? Because I, I think this is a uh, little different. So yeah. let's start from Greece versus Berlin, which is a typical European yeah. country. So and let me see. give it maybe a little bit of an. Um, HR perspective mm-hmm. first, um, like what I see for the HR function as, as mm-hmm. big differences mm-hmm. when it comes. Um, so I think that in Greece, HR is still often very much seen as a administrative function. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when I joined my first startup in Berlin, my question to the founders there was, I want a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. which means that I want to make sure that HR is part of the leadership team. Um, And even though, you know, we we see big companies and and smaller companies here um, adopting more quickly HR, still it's often very much focused on just getting the things done and the operational things done that need to get done. So 
the difference there is often that, yes, on that physical table in those executive meetings in Berlin, HR is involved, mm -hmm. whereas here, often I see HR is not involved. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit more like, uh, okay, you have to do payroll, see like the installation and that's okay. Yes, correct. Um, and I think that's, for me, that's, you know, that's something that I would really love to see change mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because, you know, the thing is, companies often say like, oh, people, you know, people should come first and people, you know, we are a people focused company. But the question, the question should be rather towards yourself to ask, are you really, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if your HR is not in those executive meetings, in those meetings where you decide on business ideas, if your HR has no business acumen and does not understand how the business really functions, um, it is really difficult for HR to also figure out, you know, what are the things we need to put in place to mm -hmm. ensure that, one, we can attract the best people we want to hire, the right people we want to hire, that we can retain them as well, and that we can also make sure that the people who should not be working at our company don't work at our company. Mm -hmm. um, and, in order, and in order to do all those things, you know, there's many different things, strategic things that HR can put in place, programs, projects that we, HR can put in place to ensure that, you know, um, with hiring the right people and retaining the right people, we can also achieve those business goals. Um, and I think there is often still, for me, the misalignment Mm -hmm. Or there is also where I see the biggest difference with, let's say, Berlin versus um, here in Greece. Yeah. Um, do you see this changing? I think you've been here for two years, I want to say. Yeah, I would yeah. say all in all two years because the first year we were basically commuting, mm -hmm. let's say, six months Berlin, six months Athens, and then uh, not last year, but the year before, 2019, September, we decided to stay uh, for good. Um, I see a difference, although, you know, in, especially in such a remote world, uh, I do mm -hmm. connect with a lot of people and I connect with a lot of uh, founders and entrepreneurs as well, and I connect with a lot of HR people as well. I do see a change, but I think it's also something, there's two sides that need to change. One, I think the HR people that work in me in Greece, and there are many of them that do, but there still is a large perspective that doesn't need to also understand what that role of mm -hmm. HR really is and how to play that role and what that means. So I think there's just one, some of the experience is lacking um, and two, also some of the confidence perhaps is lacking mm -hmm. of taking on that kind of role. And then on the other hand, um, what I see changing is that um, with having open talks and with having maybe some controversial talks as well, you know, People are getting more eye-opening ideas on, on what role HR can play, but also um, how that influences your business mm -hmm. and also on, you know, how do you take difficult decisions, for example. So I think there's, um, and look, some companies are too small that will never probably have an HR department and it's mm -hmm. likely not necessary, right? If you're five people, you're not going to have an HR department. But if you are a company that's looking to grow towards 50 and 100 people, you know, definitely I'd say you need to have an HR partner um, added to your team. Um, I think um, one of the main problems is that uh, people uh, and companies would hire an HR person because they've seen how other companies here have done that in the past. Yeah. While I think you, you should actually see what, what are your problems and maybe Actually, Panos told this in, in, in a podcast that you should stop looking here and look what happens in the whole world and mainly in the US, I mean, in, in other Western countries. Otherwise, you're trapped in, you know, this mindset yes. on how. And this is what we've seen actually exactly what you said. I mean, in my mind, HR in most great companies is about, you know, aut automatically sending uh, hiring invitations, firing people and maybe, you know, this administrative stuff. Yeah. Although, um, you know, investing in these people is really hard and you need someone who knows how to do this. Yeah. I'd like to ask you um, on this, what's the point where you would advise a company to create an HR department or, you know, start having some HR operations? And yeah. do you do that as part of your job, do you say to your... Yeah, yeah 100%. Company? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, um, so, for instance, Cube... Um, which raised a Series A last year, um, mm -hmm. as they, as we knew what their growth plan was going to be, where they were moving to, you know, I talked to um, their CEO and said, you know, 
seeing where we're going and with the Series A, you're going to be hiring pretty heavily once that Series A comes mm -hmm. in. It's important that you secure mm -hmm. somebody uh, in HR. Um, and, um, and, you know, they agreed. So when they were 11 employees, they hired their HR person, which, you know, okay. probably most companies would be like, oh, that's still quite small. But the growth that was coming afterwards was easily getting them to 50, past 50, probably going towards 100, right? So if you don't put it early in place and help to set uh, the baseline, because mm -hmm. putting all the baseline in place and making sure that you know you can then also attract the people you want to attract over the next quarters, um, it's really important. You know there are many questions mm -hmm. they will ask, and if you don't have that in place, then of course you're not going to be an attractive employer for them. So if you, especially if you want to hire particular um, um, uh, positions that are maybe not as easy to find. In the market, especially also in the local market, you know, you need to be aware of how can you attract those uh, that are maybe harder to get in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this leads to the to the following question. Uh, okay, uh, it makes sense if you are eleven, but you want to go to fifty or a hundred. That's yeah. That's crystal clear. Okay, it might not be necessarily needed today, but mm -hmm. it's needed for the future. Um, on the other hand, there are companies that are happy to, to stay at 10, 15, 20 people. Uh, maybe you don't need someone to be permanently there, mm -hmm. but you definitely need help. And there are companies that understand they need help. Yeah. For example, for us, uh, uh, what we did was consult friends or uh, other people who are close to us that work in that, so we can have some, some guidance. How would you uh, approach this problem for such companies? Because uh, then that's a personal opinion. Most of um, the HR consulting firms or hiring firms, or I don't know how you normally call them, they don't provide guidance. They just provide, you know, a few CVs yeah. and uh, that's it. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that um, there are two aspects, right? One is the, the hiring side of things, so the recruitment mm -hmm. side of things, and um, if you don't have an in house recruiter to help with this, First of all, I think having some simple tools is super helpful. Mm -hmm. So having an ATS applicant tracking system, I think in Greece, the most well-known one is workable, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, this is just something, a tool that can be super helpful. Um, and also what I like about it is that um, uh, with these tools, you know, some of them are also helpful with seasonality so mm -hmm. that you could turn them off for a certain amount of time and not have to pay for that amount of time. And then when you need to hire quite a bit more, then you can turn it on again, for mm -hmm. example. So um, it's nice to see how these companies are adapting to kind of the companies and, and their hiring uh, patterns, mm -hmm. so to speak. So I think for, for that, um, you know, I'd start with looking at how can you automate as much as possible mm -hmm. where the cost is not obviously uh, massive. But one of the things that I see happening a lot with founders is that they try to keep everything in their own hands and, mm -hmm. and, and not automate things because there's a cost involved. And that takes them away from what they actually need to be focusing mm -hmm. on, right? <laughs> so, stuff. yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, so it's important, you know, to automate things, um, but to also choose tools that are simple for you, right? You don't want to have to have a super, uh, I often say this, for example, when we have a, a startup that is still quite small um, uh, and they talk about an ATS, if you think about an ATS like Greenhouse, this is a much more complicated tool. So, you know, if you are a recruiter and you've used the ATS system, then you are quite familiar with them and you probably find it more easier to work with a tool like Greenhouse. Um, but there are tools that are much easier, you know, that are almost like, I would call it almost a Trello board that help you mm -hmm. to kind of move through just the, the, the different stages of the interviewing process. And secondly, of course, you know, I would look at um, sources that you can find online as well, on like, you know, that there's some great resources like how to go from zero to 50 to 100 mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. or even stay smaller, but how do you just do a recruitment process? Um, and I think the, the, one of the other things is, you know, join some of the HR um, communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I set up HR Greece not just for HR people. I also have people in, in this that are entrepreneurs or that are interested in HR, mm -hmm. but that do not do this in their daily uh, mm -hmm. life, so to speak, or in their work life. Um, but it helps them to get more thoughts and ideas on, oh, what's happening in the HR community? What are things that are, are you know, 
what's active, what is kind of trending, or what should we be thinking about, or if I have a question about, you know, people now having to work from home, how does that work mm -hmm. legally? Um, there's many of these things that we can help to answer. So I think um, surrounding yourself, and you mentioned it already, you mm -hmm. know, asking your friends. Yes, ask people that you know in, in your surroundings. The third thing that I would say is, you know, there are HR consultants other than, let's say, big companies like Mercer, that's a consultancy focused on HR. But you also have other, other like, consultants that are just freelancers mm -hmm. helping with providing some HR services. So whether that is helping to do your payroll or whether that is helping to implement maybe a feedback system mm -hmm. or like a performance uh, feedback system, um, there are many things that they can do. One thing you know to add to that is that other than an ATS system or for instance what we mentioned uh, briefly before using let's say an agency to help recruit for you, you also have um, let's say agencies that would put a recruiter in-house for you. Okay. So you mm -hmm. know there's um, uh, companies that would say I'm lending you my recruiter for six months. They're going okay. to embed themselves. It's almost like they've been hired by the company and they're going to hire X Y Z positions for you over the coming months. So there's many different kind of solutions from tools to to services um, to also just your local community that can mm -hmm. help you answer. Um, yeah, actually, say coming back to what you said before, Paris on um, this international uh, you know what Pano said about you know don't just look in your own range but look beyond sometimes people find it really hard where do you start right um and i think with that you want to kind of look at you know who are maybe some of the outspoken when it comes to hr i look at who are some of the outspoken hr mm -hmm. um people out there that i like to follow or that who i look mm -hmm. for inspiration to um and on top of that Having that, I will say that having that international experience, especially as an HR person, I think it just helps to open your view a bit more, which for us is, of course, extremely important because mm -hmm. when you deal with people every day that just have a very different perspective on things, mm -hmm. you know, whether it is you're setting a maternity leave, mm -hmm. uh, should that be a, a two-week leave or a three-week leave or a five-month leave or you know, what should it be is always kind of these debating things. And that has a lot to do that people often decide that based upon what their own experiences are, what they think is okay, but don't, do not have always the capacity to think beyond what could be the case. And I think working with multiple people from different types of countries, different backgrounds, etc., that international experience helps you to get a better perspective. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one is now that you talked about, okay, so how long should the maternity leave be. Um, okay, that's one question I'd like to ask. I mean, is there a silver bullet there? And mm -hmm. it depends on the country and I mean, how do you approach this? Because, and we had a discussion with Antonis in another episode here in Greece that we usually talk about diversity and, and all that stuff. And one of the things that we, I rarely hear about is how you ensure that the women can become mothers in your company. Yeah. 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 So how do you approach this issue? Yeah. I would start by saying, you know, how can we ensure that parents can be parents? Mm. So... Yes, of course, <laughs> but I mean, you do, you do have a physical burden that we do not have. A physical well. one, yes, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Um, and I think that there is something that, uh, that obviously needs... Um, that there's a time that is necessary for the mothers to recuperate. And I did not know that before I was a mother myself, <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, in, in Germany, they actually have um, a saying for that, that the, the, after the first week that you have given birth, you have to, ha you are on bed rest, meaning you should not move. In Greece, I know that, you know, there's a saying that the first 40 days, you don't exit the house. Well, <laughs> I left the house after three days because I wanted fresh air and go for a walk. But it was not smart because I felt the physical pain of that afterwards. Okay. So there actually is good reason to kind of stay <laughs> in for a period of time um, if you've uh, uh, given birth. So I think that, that there is, a, as you say, a physical aspect as to that, you know, uh, the woman needs to recover from that uh, labor. But for that physical um, 
you know, for, for that person to be able to physically recover. For some, that's much quicker than for others. So I think that's something to be thoughtful of, mm -hmm. right? How much time does one person need versus another? Not just on a physical perspective, but some mothers may have had an extremely challenging birth that also mentally has affected mm -hmm. them. Um, the same goes for the father, right? Imagine the father witnessing that uh, a birth that maybe almost went wrong. Um, you know, how do we handle yeah, that? Course. So I think um, there's many perspectives that we don't always talk about and think about. Um, on top of that, you know, uh, single parents. How do we deal with a single mom? You know, who needs help and support, or and, and how can we help and support that person as well? So you know, the goal of the company is to get that person. Um, or the, goal, the company ideally wants to get that person back to work as soon as possible. But we also need to make sure that the person is ready to come back to work, mm -hmm. physically, mentally. Um, plus also that they have the structures in place to be able to, um, to come back to work. So for example, um, I think that it's easy to set a policy, but I think if you have the trust of your employees and you trust your employees, then you can trust them also to kind of make that policy themselves. Mm -hmm. I was um, reading as I was coming uh, to, in, to the studio today uh, with the Metro, I was reading a piece from Dan Price, um, somebody that I definitely follow, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, an entrepreneur that I think sets a nice tone. You know, he said, for example, and said that his people will earn 70K regardless of their position as a minimum. But also, he said that, you know, for remote work, and I cannot quote it exactly, but pretty much he said, like, I trust you to do, to work when you work, and, mm -hmm. and bear the, the results will bear kind of, you know, the fact that you can work remote. Uh, so, um, and what I like about that, I think that is something that I'd love to see in policy books across the board, right? Mm -hmm. um, that if you, as, if you have given birth and you need to take more leave, that you are able to do so and recover from it. You know, some, um, I think that, and that counts for both parents, you know, to be fair, we were very lucky because at the time that um, we, I gave birth, you know, um, my husband was able to take some leave because of the situation with COVID. So there was a ruling in, in, in Germany that made that possible for him to work less hours um, while still getting paid for it as well. And I think that was really helpful to have him there with me as well, because as much as you know, you need to recover. You also need to take care of your baby. <laughs> plus, you have no sleep, and um, plus, you know, you need to try to take care of yourself uh, somewhat as well. So, and even simple things like you know, cooking dinner or, or you know, yeah, yeah. cleaning your house or whatnot, <laughs> like the things that may seem like weekly, daily routines, um, all of a sudden become unimportant, but still need to happen as well. So supporting companies, or I think supporting companies are those who can look at, who can maybe set the policy kind of in general, this is what we provide, but who can be very flexible and also changing that policy to the person's situation. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, they'll be like two weeks after they've given birth, they want to get back to work. Because and they, they, feel like yes. they want to contribute back or to... Because they want to work. Yep. You know, the, they like the, it that's yep. what they want and that's fine. Uh, there's no problem with that and they probably have the support system in place to be able to do that as well um, you know in some countries uh, uh, kids can go to daycare from 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 only a few weeks old whereas other countries I may say here it's been uh, nightmare trying to get fell into a daycare like he has to be two two and a half there's only mm -hmm. a few well there are some that uh, a few at a few months old they take them already but you know, we were living in the center before and it was very difficult to find mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. daycare that could do this. So I said to George, um, my boss, I said, uh, I'd like to work part-time first so that we can have somebody, a nanny, to take care of him part-time and then I will take care of him. Mm -hmm. That was fine. He was flexible with that. And I think that's my point to what you're asking, that, you know, it's fine to have a policy in place, but, you know, also give people the flexibility mm -hmm. and show that mm -hmm. you trust them when they may need that so that they can um, cope with the situation as it is. Yeah, I like what you said that uh, it's good to have a policy and also be flexible because uh, usually, not usually, sometimes companies go the other end and by trying to be a lot more flexible, yeah. they don't put like a baseline policy in place yeah. and this uh, creates 
uh, confusing because some people are not uh, feeling well asking for what they need. Yeah. And in that case, they don't even take the, the baseline that you would normally yeah. take in other places. So um, I think the combination that saying that th this is what we believe should be like uh, in most cases, but if something is different for you, then let's discuss and not you can take as much as you want. Yeah. Because th this is very vague and yeah, and it's so, often not helpful because they often take kind of what we still see as a generalized amount to be mm -hmm. taken. So a, a good example of that is that, you know, Netflix was one of the first companies to start with unlimited holidays. Mm -hmm. That was the second question I wanted to ask. I mean, I don't, <laughs> yeah. Right? And uh, unlimited holidays, uh, we had that at Wayfair as well. Um, although it was only starting at a certain level mm -hmm. and up, so to speak, from a senior position. But... Um, you know, um, I think that what we saw in, in what we saw with a policy like that is that people still often just kind of took the amount that was just the legal amount or mm -hmm. was just kind of the norm in the country. So, for example, in Germany, it's quite normal to have between 25 to 30 days of holiday per year. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, you know, it's kind of zero, zero. <laughs> yeah. 14 days after you've had like three years or five years of, ah. of, of tenure. So there it might be two weeks that people would take um, because that's maybe a little bit more the average that companies give. So, you know, I think you're making a really good point, you know, mm -hmm. is setting kind of like unlimited also right? No, I don't think that's also right. You know, I, I think that um, we need to create an environment where people really feel comfortable to come to the manager, to come to the HR team and to say like, listen, you know, our policy says that maternity leave is six months paid, for example, or you know, maybe less or whatever it is, or more. But um, I need more time um, because of, you know, X, Y, Z, or maybe they shouldn't even have to explain why. You know, I think if you hire the right people and it is your responsibility mm -hmm. as a company to hire the right people you've hired them you've hired them for a reason you should also give them the trust to do their job mm -hmm. and that's something that i would say here i still see often lacking yeah. i think I, I yeah i often see that um you know people need to earn their trust versus that trust is given um, mm -hmm. and i think that particularly in u.s companies i find that trust is often given and it's taken once you break it. So, um, and I think that's, a, from my perspective, a better approach because that way the person coming into the company can, can you know, start doing what they need to be doing in the job that they've been hired to do. Um, but yeah, getting back to the leaves, I think, you know, I do think it's good to put in a base so that people feel comfortable with that. And I do think that that is something that should be competitive as well, right? Um, at the same time, yeah, I think there should be also some writing in the policy to say, you know, that each person's situation is different. Um, and that's not with every policy, right? But particularly, let's say, with, with birth uh, of a child or, you know, now what we're seeing a lot is people getting or companies putting in a policy for people who haven't had a miscarriage, for example, mm -hmm. right? And thankfully, we're talking about these things. Um, so, you know, what do you put in place then? Or what do you put in place when somebody in your family has died or somebody close to you has died, mm -hmm. you know? Um, can you get time off and, and you know do you have to put say okay you can only get two days off or can you give that person more time so I think this flexibility um, yeah for different clauses will be extremely helpful one thing I would say to that is that you know sometimes people say yeah but we want to treat people equally um, <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is that you know if you've hired the right people in, in your company, they will also understand that why they maybe would have received less leave versus somebody that is getting more leave. Um, and that can be because of the situation that they've had. They shouldn't have to question mm -hmm. why you've made a decision to give somebody more than somebody else. Yeah, yeah. on the contrary, there are some, some cases where um, you see employees uh, discussing that either internally or more openly uh, that oh you know we have unlimited and no but parties took like three weeks I only took one so I think putting that baseline helps in uh, you know most people averaging around that and only treating specific cases differently because otherwise if it's quite open it's it's difficult to uh, to make people 
uh, feel the same about it. Um, sure. Um, I'm not I would agree, but I'd also disagree to a certain extent, mm -hmm. right? I think if people really feel comfortable and can, you know, one of the questions you often ask people to understand, you know, if they can, you know, if they, they feel comfortable in the company, if they really feel like can, is to ask if they can be themselves in the company. Mm -hmm. And um, and if they feel that you know they could not ask extra time off when they would have wanted, you should question probably why is that, mm -hmm. right? So if people talk about it, and whether you're colleagues or whether you're their manager or whichever, you know, ask them the question. But why did you feel you could not take more? Mm -hmm. Why did you not want to ask this? All you have to do is ask. Um, you know, and this, all you have to do is ask is something we need to do a lot more because the no is already there. The only thing that can change is that you get a yes, but if you don't ask, you will never get. It's right? like a powerful no without knowing the reason or exactly. having the opportunity to, to explain why. Yeah, maybe. and you're making assumptions based on your own thoughts, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, there is something there to be said about, you know, is there some is there a reason why this person felt they could not ask for these things, mm -hmm. right? If you have a really great working relationship with your manager, then I think that, you know, they would feel comfortable enough to ask these kind of questions. This leads to the next one. So yeah. I, I really like that because, uh, you know, it's a thing uh, goes uh, to the next or the things that I have in mind. So how do you make people comfortable asking those questions? Uh, because I know that okay, writing the policy is one thing, or you can have one policy and do completely different things in the day to day. So, how do you? I mean, this is trust, and you have to build it. But are there any tricks or things that uh, you believe make a lot of difference in that yeah. sense? Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say this. I was talking uh, with my colleague Alex about this yesterday about mm -hmm. some of um, some things that you see that you know I or that I particularly see that I think these are you know companies that want to build a certain culture and yet they are doing things that are kind of mm -hmm. promoting the exact opposite. Um, and also, you know, Alex shared some of his experiences that he's had or that he knows of that are things that I think like, yeah, this is exactly the opposite of mm -hmm. trying to building a trust, a trustworthy uh, uh, or to build trust in the company. So a simple example, but something people don't often think about even is how do you how do you build out your office space mm -hmm. if you have an office okay. space, right? Um, and surprisingly enough, in Greece, I still see many many self catered or mm -hmm. self cubed uh, um, offices. So mm -hmm. C level is all sitting in their own office, HR is sitting in their own office. And I will tell you, as an HR person, in all the years that I've worked, from the ones that were 20 people to 200 to 2,000 to 20,000 people, I have never had my own office. Mm -hmm. And I have not needed my own office. Sure, it means that my, you know, there, were certain, there was certain information on the screen that I could not share with others. So I was always facing, or I was always with my back towards a wall, right? So that people could not come in and uh, view my screen when I was looking at salaries, for example, or when I was looking at information that should be kept private, so to speak. But I made it work, and it worked fine, and it was not a problem, right? Um, but when I see that there are companies where, you know, where I ask the question, why are you, why do you have offices for yourselves? The number one response is always, well, I'm in meetings all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To which I respond, well, Aren't other people in your company also in meetings all day? To which they probably say, yeah, but not as much or whatnot. And I said, look, you know, for me, um, showcasing that you do not sit among your people. And even if you are in meetings all day and you need to occupy a meeting room, do that. Or you mm -hmm. need to occupy a, a telephone booth or whatever it is, do that. Or you go outside to do your calls mm -hmm. and your meetings, do that. You know, People always think about the space internal, but mm -hmm. don't think that they can actually go and have a meeting by walking around the block, for example, or having a call doing that around the block. But really sectionalizing yourself from the rest of the team, I think really sets a tone. Mm -hmm. okay. And if you want to build trust, and if you want to build, let's say, what we call an open door policy, right? You need to be really literally break down those barriers and be among your people. You know, one of, if I think about one of the leaders that 
I, you know, that I really enjoyed working with. Um, we definitely had our challenges as well, but you know, he was leading or he was our VP of International for Wayfair, and um, he, you know, he would not even always sit just at one desk, but he would also go to other people and sit the random desks in between that okay. were open. And this kind of helped to also, you know, create more like that. That he would sit beyond anyone, right? Right? Whether it was a junior analyst that he sat to next one day, mm -hmm. asking them how it was going to, you know, whether it was um, a, a senior manager or whether it was an engineer or whatnot. And doing this, you know, um, helps to to pe helps people to again feel that they are cared for. It helps them to feel that you know this person is taking interest or wants to understand or doesn't think more highly of themselves or different of themselves. Because why should you, as a C-level, so to speak, or as a, a leadership team, sit in an office um, and the rest of your team not, right? Mm -hmm. um, meetings all day is, for me, not an excuse. It's not an excuse. It is just an excuse. You can have a meeting room for that. Yes, exactly. And even if you occupy that meeting room all day, you know, mm -hmm. that is better than having something that states your name, this is my office. <laughs> CEO, uh, with a golden plate, like yeah, the, of course. the office. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think this makes a very good case that uh, by showcasing that you're no different. I mean, if you believe that everyone should have their own uh, office, that's fine. Yeah. I, I don't believe that uh, being in an open space versus having offices is the difference. No, no. But everyone having the same yes. uh, treatment. And also makes you approachable, because if you Okay, maybe that was an extreme, working from different offices every day, because yeah. it, it, it's a bit difficult to do that, to be yeah. honest, uh, if you have your setup and everything, but uh, this makes people approachable and uh, declaring that, you know, uh, I can be here for you, and uh, if I'm in a meeting, for example, it's a time that you cannot talk to me because I have business to do. So you, you define a code on how people can approach you or communicate with you. And, yeah. I mean, look, people say sometimes to me, like, okay, but, you know, if you had an HR issue and you needed to use a phone booth or you needed to use a meeting room for something urgent, and I said, listen, we always had one room that we had actually stuck a sign on that we said, listen, this is a room that is reserved for HR if they need to use it. So that the people that were in the room knew that if, uh, if me or one of my team members came there and needed to use it urgently, they had to remove themselves. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it prepares people to understand that, okay, if, if somebody from HR is coming in because they need to use the room, and, and that was fine with them, it was no problem, they understood that fully, right, mm -hmm. because we had set the expectations that they could be kicked out of that room <laughs> at mm -hmm. any time. But they knew, so it was, it was Yeah, fine. exactly. Um, and also what we did is that, like, phone booths you could not book, so we used one of the phone booths that was a larger phone booth for HR things, so that, you know, people would usually go in there randomly, mm -hmm. they didn't book it, so it was not usually a super important meeting, likely just a call that they were taking that mm -hmm. they could probably take maybe even at their desk or somewhere else, they just wanted quiet space. So, you know, setting these kind of expectations mm -hmm. helps a lot. And I guess that also helps again to your question, you know, mm -hmm. what helps with building trust is setting expectations and clear expectations. Another thing to add to that um, is some, and just to be practical about it, right? So, um, is to what I see a lot with with managers or even leaders is that they often give the solution to the problem, whereas building trust really helps when you say, you know, what would you do in this case? Tell me what you would do, mm -hmm. uh, and even if the person says, well, I don't know, then kind of help them with asking them questions to help them get to a solution. Right? Mm -hmm. Because what does that do? One, it helps to build trust that shows that, hey, you trust them to come up with something. Mm -hmm. um, but also that you're there to be supportive when they, don't, when they really don't know. And then also, you know, if they do come up with a, with a proposal or with a, with a solution, it might have been, been better than the one that you were thinking of, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and attaching to that, I would say another thing to that I would always do is hire people that are better than you at something. Mm -hmm. So if you're hiring into your team, don't hire people that you will just dictate to do what to do because then you're never going to be innovative enough. You're never going to be able to come up with great solutions and whatnot. You know, as an HR person who is leading a large team, I didn't know everything. It was also not my job to know everything. It was my job to make sure I hired people who knew things more so or better mm -hmm. than myself. 
um, who could help to, to focus on those things, right? Um, but it was my job to make sure that these, these things were moving from A to Z and that we were a good team working functionally together. Well, that uh, moves you a bit out of your comfort zone, Lisa, because uh, we're always uh, happier or safer or feel safer to, to hire people that we can judge 100% if their solution was correct because we know the answer. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's but not usually how I think that's progress. what we often perceive. Mm -hmm. But when we're actually in the situation that we're working with someone, um, actually, I was thinking about um, Euros from um, Reborn. Reborn is a consultancy mm -hmm. firm here in, um, in Athens. And one of their founders was saying, you know, he had something posted on his LinkedIn, I think a few weeks ago, that talked about um, being so excited to, be, to work with people that are smarter than him. Mm -hmm. And this, for, for me, is also, this is such a big truth, because the only way you can gather more information, the only way you can learn more, as I talked about earlier, is if you surround yourself with people that know more than you, that are smarter than you, that, you know, and if you don't do that, so it may be scary to not know about mm -hmm. these things, but owning up to saying, hey, actually, I have no idea about that. Like, if you ask me a question today that I don't know how to answer, I'll tell you, I, I don't know, I can't answer that. And that's okay, you know, that's not a problem. And if somebody judges me for that, so be it. So I know who I am, and I think that, you know, um, we need to not think about those particular things, but rather what we can contribute. Mm -hmm. And everybody has something they can contribute. But at the same time, if you want to move forward, if you want to grow your business, if you want to move things along, then you need to get insi other insights and not just your own. Because mm -hmm. you cannot, you know, you cannot learn just from yourself. You need others to help you progress and to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to to ask first a question um, because you we talk, we talked about how the office plays a role in in, in building trust. How does that work for remote working companies? I mean, yeah. now that you don't have these uh, barriers, but you have a different situation, how does this compare? Yeah. I mean, uh, concerning trust and how you build trust. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's a very interesting question. So before, we, before I talk about what actually helps to build that trust, maybe I can also um, say a little bit like what is kind of one of the things that I've heard so many you know, people who are wary about remote work talk about, which is, you know, but how do I know that they're doing their job? Mm -hmm. So my question or my answer to that would rather be a question and say, well, how did you know they were doing their work before? I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> they were there, typing on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's not a result, right? You need to measure results. So whether you measure it by um, by actually hard facts or whatnot, or you measure it in a, in a different way, the results that the person bears will actually showcase whether or not the person is actually doing a good job or not. Mm -hmm. right? um, and of course, you can put programs in place like performance reviews or things like that. Um, that could probably help to assist with that. But ultimately, you know, I think that. Um, Again, if you're building a good culture, people will ask for help when they don't, when they're stuck, when they don't know how to go further. They will um, also acknowledge when their results are not good or when they've underperformed. You know, they'll be aware of these kinds of things. Um, so I think coming back to saying, you know, what what do you do to create trust um, in a remote environment? Um, I think one of the things that I see consistently with the remote, fully remote or remote first companies that what they do is document things. Mm -hmm. So they're really great at documentation. If you look at a company like GitLab as well, you know, their documentation is even very open for everyone to read, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. So documentation is super important. Um, I think it's about giving people also an open voice, um, you know, about how, you know, how do, what do they talk about, uh, or can they talk about openly, whether it be on mm -hmm. Slack or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also about being supportive with how do you um, ensure that, um, so how do you ensure that you know how people like to work, right? So, so um, 
what what kind of information um, is best said over a phone call versus a, or a video mm -hmm. call versus what is best over Slack or what is best over you know an email. Um, certain things like if you're going back and forth on Slack for mm -hmm. like you know more than ten lines, it's probably better to pick up the phone or mm -hmm. have a quick call and uh, or a huddle and uh, continue on from there. Whereas other things, you know, meetings that take a lot of time that could have been an email, you know, just massive failures. You never have those kind of meetings. So I think there's some 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 practical things. But ultimately, you know, one of the things that we saw at Hajar as well, what what I see with many remote companies still seeing as one of the most important things is still getting the team together as well, physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, um, there are certain people um, that definitely are very focused and can just and only wish to just work remote and really do those team gatherings as well. Um, so perhaps there should be somewhat of a choice in that as well. But there are many people who really feed off of the energy as well, the in-person interaction. And mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, what you notice very clearly is that online people are very, are, can be sometimes very different to how they are in person. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, of course. I, <laughs> I remember very well that I was, uh, when I was at Hajar, I spoke to, um, 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 a manager online. Um, who, factually enough, is uh, now one of the co-founders of one of the companies uh, in our portfolio, Andrew. All right. Uh, yeah, really great guy. And I remember that um, we had a call, and uh, once we closed the call, I thought, yeah, my intro was a little bit rough. Like, I just kind of went into it without really introducing myself. It was not really, uh, that was not really great. And then I met Andrew um, on the airport in Athens because mm -hmm. he lives in um, Cyprus and we were moving um, to Portugal for an event, a company event. And he said, wow, you're so different in person, so much nicer <laughs> than when I met you on the, on, the, on, the, you know, on the call. I said, yeah, I realized afterwards that that was, I don't know, it was just really stiff and I think I was just kind of in the zone and uh, trying to get through things that day. I said, sorry about that. He's like, yeah, no worries. But you just notice, right? Right away, the barriers yeah. are gone. And th that, that's what I was about to say. Usually people in person are better than they are online. Yes. Because I mean, online, I because online you, you, it's so much isolated that you think that, um, you, I mean, cognitively, you don't see the other person on the other side. It might feel like a bot. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, why do we have trolls online? Yeah, right? because they feel that they can just say whatever they want mm -hmm. at any particular time to any particular With no person. consequences. No, and also because they don't see the person's actual response or feeling, right? If I say something to the two of you now that kind of hurts you, even if you say nothing, I can see it probably in your faces that, you know, that was not the right thing for me to say. Um, and even with video calls, you know, I think video calls are always better than not video calls, mm -hmm. but even then mm -hmm. it's sometimes difficult to recognize that because the person might be twitching maybe with their thumbs under the table and you don't see that because they're cut off at the mm -hmm. moment, right? So um, those kind of in-person things are, are really important. It's also something why now you see so many uh, apps and, uh, coming up and tools coming up for mental health, right? Mm -hmm. One yeah. of the things that really... You know, mental health is not just being recognized now because it was never an issue. Sure, it was. But definitely the pandemic and people working from home mm -hmm. has increased that, right? Uh, increased it also because um, it's more difficult to actually spot it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give it an example as well. At Wayfair, we also had a remote team uh, uh, that was fully working from home. And one of the things that was difficult for us to spot is when we saw that there were mental health issues. Mm -hmm. You know, you can often spot it by somebody not maybe turning on their cameras or things like that, or you know, there's mm -hmm. there's other things. But um, that's one of the things that was often more difficult. Whereas when you were in person and you just notice, you know, you can notice, yeah. oh, hey, something's not right. Let me take the person aside and say, hey, what's going on? Resolution is uh, definitely lower when it comes to remote communications and yeah. I don't think this can change massively. No. It can be improved. I mean, video is a great improvement, better video quality is an even better thing, but yeah. the resolution from, you know, feelings, uh, tone of voice, you have so many different uh, things to, to catch on when you're in person yeah. that you cannot uh, integrate that in yeah. video calls, metaverse or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go uh, this road, but I mean, 
I mean, it's good in the future, right? Um, but you know, that's when we teach computers about feelings and what they actually <laughs> are. But okay, we're getting closer to that. So I, I don't think that that is an impossible, but I'm not sure that I will still be working in the field of HR uh, <laughs> when that is possible. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I think you, you make a point. Uh, um, yeah. I'd like to ask, I have a couple of controversial ones I'd like yeah. to bring on the table. <laughs> so the first one is, um, what do we talk about in the company? So l last year there was a controversy with um, a company called Basecamp because um, a few employees said a few things I mean, yeah. uh, that were kind of crazy. And this all started from heated discussions about um, societal I mean, uh, subjects. So how do we handle this in the company? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it surely quite a few things went wrong in that case, but. I mean, driving from that, I mean, how, how do we do this? Yeah, how do we do this in an unremote way, right? It also happens. And yeah, I mean, in both, in both scenarios. Yeah. So I think that, but we need to, um, people need to be able to be their own selves when they come to work. I fully believe this. And if you cannot do that, you cannot bring mm -hmm. your best self and deliver the best work that you can. Um, of course, I've also had situations in the past where I've had to talk with somebody and say this and you really hurt this person's feelings or hey, you know, this is maybe not the best conversation to have because of so and so. But we're all adults. We can have those conversations. But for a company like Basecamp to just put in a policy like this, I think it's restrictive. Um, I don't agree with it. I think that people need to be able to voice themselves and, you know, it's a similarly like how now there's this controversy on LinkedIn of like, can you, should you be posting personal things and, you know, mm -hmm. you see pictures with people and they're, they're newborns or you see the people, women that are pregnant or things like this. And people are acting and saying that, um, you know, this is not the right platform <laughs> for this. Says who? Who says that? <laughs> right? Like, sorry, if you don't mm -hmm. like it, keep scrolling. Like, what are you doing here then anyway? Like, move on. There's a lot of things that people don't like. I would say, you know, if something's really hurtful, then you can address that. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an example like that even on LinkedIn where somebody posted what they thought was encouraging to women and maternity leave, but in fact was quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and instead of just saying, you know, you're an asshole or, you know, you shouldn't be talking about this, whatnot, you can also give them the perspective as to why this is hurtful or why this is mm -hmm. not something that, you know, this person should likely be talking about. So um, I don't think that we should, um, um, you know, ban it uh, at all. I think you can help to give it a place. So if you say, hey, you know, if you want to have some banter or if you want to have, you know, particular talks, maybe there are certain Slack groups that you talk about these things and other Slack groups are for other things, right? But, you know, you do, I do think you need to give people a platform uh, to be able to talk about these things and at the same time also to not have to participate in those things. Um, but if you don't, then you cut off per the person themselves and, you know, you take them completely out of what, um, yeah, what I think life and reality is about. Um, we cannot make everything sweet and nice, right? Yeah. There are going to be difficult times and hard times and you need to go through those as well. But you want to um, deal with them in the most fair, open and, you know, um, I would say even kind mm. way possible. Also, maybe you can just hire people that can disagree politely about stuff and even if they fight, which might happen from time to time, they can just sort it out afterwards and say, yeah, okay, you know, I'm sorry about that, let's... Yeah, work. I mean, this guy, look... I mean, it's about trust at the end of the day that yeah. people can, can work it out together. You know, there, there's this, this idea that they say, you know, um, communication is super important. And, you know, I remember many, many years ago reading a piece of like, if you would put, you know, 20 people with the same uh, culture, background and uh, language in one place, you know, they will communicate likely very well together and have a good understanding and be able to do a job very well. But what you'd be lacking is the innovation mm -hmm. because these kind of discussions of disagreement, you know, is what brings mm -hmm. innovation. It's not the discussions where we agree upon each other, yeah. right? So if you don't have those kind of discussions anymore and if you cannot disagree upon things, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that, you know, 
that you need to start to fight. That's when things get really when things get really personal. But particularly if we're talking about, you know, I think we should structure something in this way, or I should think we should structure something in this way. If you if you don't disagree, if you don't agree on the two ways of that where you cannot come to an agreement, you know, have somebody else decide on mm. which way to go. And then you yeah. choose that path. Um, but that's not always possible. It's also why you see companies fail, right? Mm. Because maybe two founders or three founders don't agree with each other anymore and they take mm. different paths and one leaves and that's it. Yeah. So And sorry, this yeah. brings me to the last controversial one I'd like to ask, which is about equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Yeah. In, in a company which is around the whole diversity thing. Mm -hmm. And I would like to state my opinion yeah. on that first uh, and then <laughs> ask yeah. yours. I think, yeah. I think it's the right thing. I'd love it if yeah. we could disagree. So um, you, you have a company full of white, hairy, Greek dudes. I mean, and you, you say, okay, I'd like to change that. Because I think we agree that the more different people you have, the more different perspectives you have, so you can have a more um, global outcome. Mm -hmm. So if um, I think it's easier to reach a global audience for your company if your personnel is also yeah. you know, as, as global as possible. So there, I think right now there are few, quite a lot of companies actually that have policies like, okay, we need that percentage of that um, uh, group, that percentage of that other group, mm -hmm. and this, does not make sense to me at all because I think it opens up um, a gate where you can uh, you have to hire people because of what they are and not the work they do and I think what you need to do is make sure that the whole company the whole process all processes are built to focus exactly on what that person does yeah. although that might be hard especially at scale. I think that's the way to go. And if you don't, I mean, if you don't have uh, women uh, engineers uh, applying to your um, to your company, it might be an issue with the society which you ca cannot solve. You just have to make sure you have all the processes there. I'm not sure if I got yeah. the right. If you what? what's Sure. So I would agree and disagree. Um, yeah. I Sounds good. <laughs> okay. I agree with you on the fact that you know reporting on numbers should not be your main priority, mm -hmm. so to speak, and that, that that it's you should hire the person because they're the best person for the job, not because they are um, you know female or because you want to upgrade female rating in engineers. No, but um, having said that, you know we do know through research that many people are biased in mm -hmm. choosing who they think is the best for mm -hmm. the position. Um, okay. Whether that is because of someone's name, for example, so they might not even have seen the person, or because of the, what the person looks like, or whether they can identify themselves with that person, mm -hmm. or they can see some similarities, um, right? And um, so based on those things, we see that there are massive biases towards make, you making your decision to who you think is the right person. Mm -hmm. Now you might think you know you don't have a bias, but you do. Everybody okay. has this bias. If right? you have a bias, you usually don't understand it. It's it's not intentional. Yes, most of times. exactly. And um, it, it is already really great if you can try to source your biases and understand you know who you know who do you think is right for a job or not. I have them as well. I know that I do, right? But um, this is why it's so important that when you want to hire somebody, for example, that you really clearly state and like write it out what would be really the specific core things that this person should be really great at, right? Uh, that you don't describe kind of like if they're a fun and nice or uh, outgoing person or whatever, but rather describe really what are the capabilities that this person has and what you know, does this person take these types of boxes. Um, so I would agree that yes, numbers is not, is not something we should focus on in, in that degree. But it does help us to also kind of think about, you know, are we just hiring similar profiles here, or okay. do we see that mm -hmm. there, you know, do we do have a difference in rating? Like, are we so are we really for hiring for you know the quality of the person, or are we? And and if you do, then you will see more diversity and not just always similarity, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I said that um, what I don't is what I don't agree with is the fact that um, you cannot change society. 
mm-hmm. because I think you can, mm-hmm. um, and I think companies can as well. So, for example, you know, um, women uh, definitely are underrepresented in engineering, mm-hmm. but we're seeing that this is going up. You know, and and what we can see is that in society, changes are being made, right? So, Lego, for example. Uh, when you go to Lego's website now, if I'm not mistaken, you can no longer search for boys or girl, girls' toys. Okay. Right? So you can search for, uh, they don't categorize them based on the gender anymore, which is great because why should, you know, the astronaut be a boy's toy or the policeman be a boy's toy mm-hmm. and the horseback riding girl be a girl's toy? Why can the boys not have that one and the girls have this one? You know, if I think about it in my own boy, he loves sweeping the floor with a broom mm-hmm. every day. You know, it would, this is what he wants to do every day. So if that's what he wants to do, let him do that, right? And I think these kind of societal changes is what makes it different. So we can make those changes by me even starting at what do I give to my son? Do I just give him cars and trucks? Well, now he loves bulldozers. So yes, I'll give him a bulldozer to play with. But if he wished to play with a doll, I would just as well give him a doll to play with. Mm-hmm. And it starts with these small things in society that helps to then bring women also to jobs that were always very male focused, right? And so, vice versa. And vice versa, yeah. No, I, it's I, not I, to say that there's not in particular interest. I agree with that. See, yeah. I was, I, I'm just not sure what you can do as a company at the hiring level. This is what I meant. I wasn't sure yeah. what more you can do. But I agree exactly with what, with yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, so I think on a hiring level, there's a lot of things that you can do, right? Um, but it starts also with what you were mentioning before on that it starts internally how do you attract or maybe you've mentioned yourself how do you attract these women mm-hmm. to the company mm-hmm. right if all your leadership is men with let's say uh, wearing slacks and checkered shirts then okay then I know that's probably not the place that I'm going to be in mm-hmm. right uh, because I don't see somebody that I feel represents me um, and now especially I would say in the last two years uh, the you know, so diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a massive topic. So it's coming forward more and more and more. Um, and we see that you know people are being hired um, much more into positions um, um, uh, because they see that they could actually do that job just mm-hmm. as well. Versus you know um, maybe not considering them because they don't identify mm-hmm. with the person sitting in front. So if you see a company where the, the whole executive level is all the same is because those people were hired be- likely because they saw themselves and mm-hmm. those people they therefore trust that they can okay. do the job versus somebody that they maybe put you know a screen in front and really uh, heard the answers of what they could actually do. So. Yeah. Maybe changing course initially is a bit harder and it's like a harder push. So for example, you would go to extra means to find the people that would you like to to be tomorrow's uh, image of the company yeah. and then slowly migrate to something that uh, this comes organically and you don't have to do extra effort to, to yeah. bring someone that's not the same as people from the company. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit hard in the beginning but then I think at some point it starts being more organic that this happens yeah. because of uh, previous choices. Yeah. Because uh, on the other hand I've heard statements like uh, I would like to hire, to hire a new engineer and we want somebody who's going to be great for the job, or female, ideally both. And I, I think this is not this is not nice. Hiring yeah. someone because of you pick the female. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. And also, what I see a lot here is like, thankfully, in some jurisdictions, you know, it's all already banned to mm-hmm. say, for example, you must have X amount of experience. Mm-hmm. So um, I wrote a piece last year on building trust. And I also wrote a piece on you know job descriptions, and one of the things that I said is don't write how many years of experience you're looking for because what is years of experience really? And what you should rather do is explain exactly what that is for you. So if you're mm-hmm. looking for somebody, a, a developer that has five years of experience, okay, great, but what does that really mean for you? you right? Mean nothing for five years. For me, five years of experience, somebody could have been, yeah, I like that. you know. Um, yeah, building something um, that was maybe super easy to do, mm-hmm. whereas somebody else could have been, you know, been in the nitty gritty of, of many more different or difficult things. So um, it's more important to describe 
what it is that you're looking for in the candidate versus like years of experience. Which is identification, I mean. And it also identifies again, you know, how young or how old that person is. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm uh, 23 years old and I need to have five years of experience, I'm probably just out of uni if, if that's right. So how's that ever going to get me there? But maybe I've actually um, already done a lot of programming before mm -hmm. since I was like 16. Not actually super advanced. It's just that I didn't count that as years of experience. Now I decide not to apply for a job that says five years of experience mm -hmm. because, well, you know, I need to have five years of experience. Or I don't know what that means and to I, the person. Exactly. Whereas, you know, if you think about what they, what you're asking them to do and they think, hey, actually, I'm actually very capable of doing those things, they will actually apply for it. And in particular with women, this is the case. Mm -hmm. So with men, you guys are a little bit more easy <laughs> than if you say, oh, I'll take three boxes, I will, I will apply for it, right? Whereas women are much more stringent with that and they say, oh, if I don't take one of the boxes, I'm probably not good enough and I won't apply. It's more like uh, I need to take all or yeah. not some. Exactly. So again, you're losing probably great candidates who would otherwise apply yeah. just because you're not stating these things. And that's the same with job description stating what you really need versus what is a nice to have, right? You see it so often uh, and something, not that I want to offend anybody with that, but you know, you see so often these positions of like full stack developer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. But what does that really mean to you? Because mm -hmm. either somebody is a little bit better at the front end side or somebody is a little bit better at the back end side. So what does it mean for you that full stack developer? Mm -hmm. And of course, when you have smaller companies, they often want you to have some knowledge perhaps of the back end or some knowledge of the front end or what not to overlap. But I think if you hire really great people, they usually have a focus on one or the other. Um, and full stack is nice to have and nice to know that you have some additional, but I do think that it's also, uh, you need to still think with these positions, what should the focus really be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen that. You cannot have like, you know, 10 programming languages and frameworks and think yeah, of that course. everybody knows all of these things. Yeah. Uh, I think that I've seen uh, as, a, as a good example of uh, things like full stack developers or um, positions where you have a more broad uh, space of uh, things that the person will interact with is uh, describing all the, the things in the duties. So in your day-to-day, -day, you might do front-end or back-end or both. So you, you do this as a duty or as a day-to-day. -day. And then on the experience, you, you state that we want experience in this or that. So it's, it's in the same bullet. Yeah. And then it's easier to, for the person to, to check it because yeah. whatever you do, at the end of the day, people are taking bullets when they want to apply somewhere. Yeah. They might be men and take less bullets, but they need to take some time, yeah. so it's uh, Which is also, there's a question, should you write a job description with bullets? That's an interesting thing. Yeah. What's your take on that? No. I think you should not, probably. I think if you can be more descriptive, right, of just mm -hmm. talking about the role, and usually the way I think that can be done easily is by just saying like, hey, you know, describe to me this person, let me write it down. Right? Mm -hmm. And that way you don't tick box, but you actually write a description of the per ideal person. And I think that's a better way of going about it because then somebody can identify themselves also with that and say, oh, actually, oh, that sounds quite good. Yeah. That sounds like me. Yeah. I'm like I'm yeah. in my life. Yeah. Okay, now I'll, I'll go back a bit to yeah. the start of conversation and uh, discuss two things that I would like to, to pair them with all the nice things we've been discussing uh, until now. So. The two things are, you, you, are, you have created a group called HR Greece, mm -hmm. uh, which has startup companies, bigger companies, smaller companies. Yes. So I would like to see how these companies compare to all the things we've been discussing. So you've seen that, for example, smaller companies are easier to adapt or slower, or how, what's your take on, on, that, on that thing? Yeah, um, I think it really depends a little bit. Um, I see that there are certain startups that um, mm -hmm have a mindset of what I would call a dinosaur, Okay. right? Um, that are still pretty slow moving, but also in their way of thinking is you know, not really on trend with what I would call a startup, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that you need to have ping pong tables. Let's never talk about that, please. <laughs> but you know, that does mean kind of that, again, that you give trust probably versus like needing or asking to first build trust. Um, and I think that um, 
And I, on the other hand, I see rather larger companies, you know, that, you know, one would wonder, do we still consider them to be startups? Yes or no. Blue Ground is a good mm-hmm. example. You know, they are getting quite large. Are they still a startup? Are they not? Um, that you would, that, you know, have really innovative ways of thinking. They came up with their policy on, on, on remote work and things like this. And, um, we're also publicly publishing that. And, you know, these are things that I really like, or I personally really like to see, um, because, you know, they're not afraid to share information. That's also what HR Greece is about. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to push more is that people share information, you know, um, so I think the differences between the, there are differences between smaller startups and bigger startups or big corporates. Um, I think that definitely in startups, small startups, things can move faster because you have li- less lines of approval, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you. But at the same time, I think that sometimes bigger companies think more broadly about a particular idea, um, which maybe a smaller startup might miss. Mm-hmm. So. Um, so I think there's a combination of things, and this is also why I didn't want to make uh, HR Greece exclusive to just, let's say, startups mm-hmm. or small startups, because I think we can all learn from each other. And um, this is why I think it's really important to bring a group together of, again, different perspective, right? That's mm-hmm. what I've yeah. been saying the whole time. It's like, bring that different perspective, bring the different experiences together, because only then can you build things stronger. Um, and one thing I notice is that in Greece, definitely people don't talk as much. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think people like to talk about things, but they don't always like to share information as much. And I'm trying to showcase that, you know, if we want to be competitive, not just in this market, but on a global scale, we need to kind of work together to share information and make sure that our companies in Greece all become super strong employers. Um, and strong with that, I mean, you know, attractive employers. So that not just people in Greece, where we can see that, you know, um, um, definitely um, the, the the scale is going down of, of let's say the amount of people that we can employ because people are either leaving the company or not go, or leaving the country or not coming back. Um, that we can attract people from mm-hmm. outside of Greece to also come and work here, uh, whether that's Greeks who went abroad uh, so many years ago or whether that's anybody else, myself included, from you know, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's good one to come and work here. But in order to do that, you need to have, create attractive employers. If my employer was not attractive to me, I would not be working there. Mm-hmm. I would maybe work remote for a different company. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we want. We want to build the companies here. So we need to make sure that we work together to build the best companies. And that leads me to the to the next question, which is uh, a very nice work you did uh, as part of uh, your role at Marathon, yeah. um, which was the a survey uh, with a bunch of companies and uh, where you described the different salaries, which were the ranges uh, yeah. from different levels or positions or expertise. Uh, I have a few things that. Uh, were pretty interesting to me, uh, and I would like to discuss okay. them. But uh, I would like to, to first understand what was the initiative. What would you like to, to do for this? We will definitely put the yeah. link on the bottom, yeah. uh, on the description for that. But yeah, I would like first to, to hear your your take on why and what did you learn from doing it, mm-hmm. and then I have a few things in my mind that I'd like to okay. discuss. Sure. Um, so my thinking behind it was: what is something that I can bring to the community that will be helpful to the community in the biggest way possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so when, when I started a marathon, one of the things that came up repeatedly was you know attracting talent, and everybody's talking about oh it's so difficult to attract talent, and the market in Greece is extremely small. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are certain positions, particularly development positions, engineering positions, that are very difficult to fill here. And um, I thought to myself, okay, how do I attract then perhaps people from outside of Greece or Greeks living abroad to come back to Greece? And um, what are the things that are their main concerns? And there were two things. One was company culture, Mm -hmm. which is what we talked about about today. And the other thing was compensation. Um, So most people that I talked about to said to me, look, I'm not going to earn more than a thousand euros per month Mm -hmm. while I'm making like 4K where I am right now. 
And I said, okay, that's a fair call, um, but is that really the truth? And you know, knowing what I knew from our companies and what they were paying, I thought that's not the truth because mm-hmm. I know what our companies are currently paying. But I said, okay, I can just go out there and say that. Who says they're going to believe me, right? Whereas if I get more companies to join in, I can make it beneficial both for the companies to get more data, uh, start to get more data on compensation in Greece as well as to make sure that you know we can publish something externally that showcases where we currently start as, stand as a market and that, that is maybe quite off from what people are actually thinking. Mm-hmm. So this was the initiative uh, where we started. We, you know, I spoke to many, many companies. I also had a bet running with George my boss on um, you know, how many companies I would be able to attract. Did you win? I win, I won, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not for that, that, that he thought less of me, absolutely not. But of course, compensation is a super fragile topic to talk about, right? And here I am, this foreign person um, that comes in and I've never spoken to any of these people. And the first thing I ask them is, share with me all of your compensation data. <laughs> Um, so you can imagine you know, what I said before, in a country where people are already not so much mm-hmm. sharing information, how would they feel about sharing information um, um, that was so, uh, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I would say... Um, Critical or secretive? Yeah, something you don't talk about a lot, right? So, and I must say, out of all the companies, I think I approached probably 40 companies or so, maybe a bit more. Um, of which 27 participated. Mm-hmm. The others, mostly it was not good timing because I asked them to deliver it within two weeks, uh, which mm-hmm. is a bit short turnaround. Um, but, um, you know, and there, was, and there was only one company that said they would not share their data with a mm-hmm. third party. Okay. So I think that was a pretty good result. Um, yeah, and that's how we got started. Yeah, it was. It was great actually. And we were discussing because um, we do have two employees in our company and we're going to hire a new one. Mm-hmm. We were discussing, okay, do we pay them well? And I was thinking, I know that um, abroad uh, you can buy benchmarks, market yeah. benchmarks. And to here see too. How, how you, here too? Yes. Do you know about that? Yes. But this was a free benchmark that you gave us. Actually. Yes, <laughs> of course. And that was my point also because, look, there is big companies like Willis Towers Watson, Mercer, um, there's multiple companies like this. And that you can buy benchmarks from That you can buy okay. benchmarks from. The problem is that startups don't buy these benchmarks because they're expensive. Mm-hmm. So that means that if you even were to buy a benchmarking data, it would okay. probably not include the companies that you want to be And that's the other thing, it was a relevant benchmark. Yes. It's often irrelevant because they're very large companies. So you can think of the FMGs mm-hmm. or the big pharmas or you know companies like this in Greece that participate in this, right? But yeah, the, these surveys cost thousands of euros. Um, you know, so that's expensive data. And especially then if it doesn't seem really relevant because you think, you know, we're not really with the big corporates who want to compare with the with the with the um, startups then um, yeah, it's not super helpful. And this is why I think also some of the startups that participated that have also bought benchmarking data were really happy with this data and found it super helpful, Mm -hmm. probably more helpful than that which they had paid for because it was more along the lines of, you know, where they wanted to stand. The nice thing I think was though that, you know, Dunstad did a a compensation survey, these big, uh, agencies often do these kind of compensation surveys and launch them for free, but okay, it's not always super detailed, and you know there are certain things that are a bit more tricky. But we could see that you know between what we saw with the startups in Greece that we surveyed in comparison to what they did, that mm-hmm. there was not a massive differences in some cases. You know, startups were even paying better, and I think that was also a really nice kind of mm-hmm. um, facts to state to kind of say like, hey. We can see that you know we don't have to shy away from being thinking we cannot compete with the big corporates as well. Yeah. So the first thing that was uh, interesting to me when I was uh, seeing the, the survey was that okay, of course in the in the high end, I would consider normal to have a big deviation between uh, you know smaller and bigger because I think you have margins and then median salary or something yeah. like that. But it was interesting that there was also I think big deviation in the very. Uh, junior positions or like entry level positions, yeah. and that was interesting to me. So, how do you do? You believe this is true? 
why this is true. Yeah. So I think because, I mean, you shouldn't forget that, you know, startups that we surveyed were startups from like a pre-seed stage to mm-hmm. up to like, you know, past the stage of, of, of uh, compensation. And so, yes, startups are paying well in general, but there are startups that are pay, can, cannot afford to pay mm-hmm. that top end yet, right? If they pay less, maybe they pay more with equity, which is something we didn't report on. We reported okay. on whether equity was given or not. But not whether what the value of that is, and oh. that's because it's just extremely difficult to really dictate the value of that, right? But um, you know, it would be very interesting to see, you know, what's the percentage of, of of equity, for example, that is given in one company versus another, and mm-hmm. those that are paid higher, is it a different uh, percentage versus those that are being paid lower? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, of course, there are the jobs that are paying a th- thousand euros or maybe less per month, and there are those that are paying uh, double the amount, if not more. So I think there, there's a difference. The other difference is also that, you know, each person has a certain value. Mm-hmm. So the skills that you bring to a job uh, for one company that is a junior position, for another company that's maybe already a mid level position. Mm-hmm. So I think this was also the trickiest thing to kind of outline in the whole report is how do we ensure that the levels are, are somewhat similar and equal. Um, and the way we did that is by having, or the way I did that is by having different levels and written out myself what those levels really mean. Mm-hmm. Not by years of experience, because again, I don't believe years of experience. I did report on that. And clearly it also showed that there were people in a more junior, let's say in a developing level, that mm-hmm. had like 15 years of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't really have people with two years of experience in the VP level, but course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there were differences in that. So, you know, on the opposite side of things, you know, looking at junior levels, you also had super senior levels that, you know, super senior levels that maybe started at like 15K per year. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is that often founders don't pay themselves much, right? So mm-hmm. you will see that um, founders maybe are giving themselves a super low salary to ensure that and um, all the everything that you know comes into the company goes back into the company mm-hmm. and not to themselves. Awesome, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was interested to understand your, your take on it because mm-hmm. I mean your experience is far better than mine <laughs> on the matter. So uh, I was trying to understand why do we see those differences. Yeah. Uh, but on the like the, the mid levels, I saw more uh, convergence in the in the yeah. salaries. Or yeah. that's what I remember because it's been six months or yeah. more. Yeah, and that makes sense as well because there it's often a little bit easier to establish kind of the, the, the levels at the beginning and the end or because of what I mentioned before are reasons why they uh, would maybe be so so, so different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, <laughs> very informative. I think I'll, I'll have to see the, the video like 10 times more to, <laughs> to grasp all the information. Yeah, me as well. Me as well. <laughs> Well, we'll actually launch another report this year. Awesome. So we'll do it again. Um, you know, people have asked me also, do we need to pay for it? Not yet, but um, I will say it took a lot of my time. Mm-hmm. So it may be that if, you know, we'll see how we go this year. We're going to expand it to all positions. I'm putting that in mm-hmm. brackets because it's not going to be great. all positions, yeah. but not just tech. We're also doing commercial mm-hmm. roles. Um, because we just see the need for it and how many people came afterwards and said, oh my god, this was super helpful, right? Um, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think the goal of it is to, to, to you know, uh, have companies pay for it, but when it comes to a point that it is at such a big size, I mean, you need to understand the last size was like 10,000 data points that mm-hmm. I had to look into. Um, and now, you know, doing that took quite a lot of my time. So if we would need to hire somebody to help with that, then it is possible that I'd say, look, we ask companies to pay a, a little something to help cover the cost of that. But the goal of it, again, is to help the community and to help the companies build. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's also at the core of Marathon, mm-hmm. what, what we want to achieve. Are you planning to make this uh, an open call? Because I think last time it wasn't... Uh... Yeah, so the, the first time, I mean, as I said, right, me reaching out to companies, nobody knew me at that time. I think now um, probably a bit more people know of me or at least of the report, so it will probably be a bit easier, easier because it was a lot of time <laughs> of outreach as well uh, over months, uh, to be fair. Um, 
But I think that, you know, so I think that, you know, many of the companies participated last year will likely participate again this year. And then I think many of who couldn't will also participate and then we'll open it up for anybody else mm -hmm. who wants to participate as well. So, yeah, we'll definitely do an open call. Um, in May, HR Greece is going to do a talk on compensation. So then nice. we'll probably also announce when we're going to start opening them mm -hmm. then for the next round. Um, yeah, because, yeah, I think it's uh, something that's helpful and informative for everyone. Um, we will focus on tech companies uh, mostly because we do need to kind of set a focus point. Um, I think that is important for us, but nevertheless, you know, uh, mm -hmm. all the data we can get is always helpful in understanding the market. Better. Awesome. Great stuff. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, where do we find you? Or do we find the report? How can people join? Uh it's a breeze. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the easiest way is to connect with me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, or if you don't have LinkedIn, not a problem. Send me an email at sana at marathon.com. And then I will set, invite you to the Slack group as well. Um, yeah, anybody, as I said, is welcome to join who's interested in the topics who would like to understand. Um, and we don't uh, you know, have secret discussions or anything like this. Um, it's more to be informative to the, to the, to the community, so to speak. Awesome, amazing stuff. So as we slowly go to the end of today's talk, uh, it was amazing uh, to, to be fair about it. I mean, I, I really enjoyed yeah. it. Uh, so for the end, we can suggest something. So if you want to suggest something, be it podcast, video, a product, a place to go, I don't know, whatever you want, yeah. uh, feel free to do it. You can either go first or last, whatever you prefer. So, I'll go last, so you guys can go okay. first. <laughs> uh, so, do you have anything in mind? Um, yeah, I'd like I'd like to um, to share. There's a blog post from uh, Zaharenia, uh, which is um, about how um, that TV series called Ted Lasso compares with you know managing people. Although I think um, I'm not sure I agree with everything there. I think it's a very interesting approach and something very useful for everyone um, to read. Awesome. Uh, we'll put it down. I had something in mind, now it's slipped. Uh, <laughs> Shall I go next? Yeah. Then? Okay, you can think about yours. Um, so, look, I think that there are certain, if you're, of course, I will say join HR Greece if you're very interested in HR topics, right? Um, definitely participate, mm -hmm. of course, in the next round if you're a company that would like to participate in the next round for the compensation report. Um, but I think also, you know, um, keep a lookout on Marathon's blog. We talk about a lot of topics that I think are really interesting, whether it's from product, marketing, um, tech related, or, or from an HR perspective, or, you know, one of the things that Thalia, my colleague and I are working on is on ESOP, so talking about equity, mm -hmm. um, which we see, you know, is something that's a topic we really need to talk and address a lot more. Um, but also, you know, looking at more international things, um, one of the things that I really like, or, or people that I really like to follow is called, his name is Joris Leuke. He was previously working at Atlassian. And I think that he has a pretty nice perspective. He has a, really, a new company called PIN uh, that talk, goes about onboarding and stuff. Um, so yeah, following some people on LinkedIn that have, I think, innovative things. Dan Price, I talked about uh, already, who I think mm -hmm. is really nice. And now I had to mention of many already, only oh, about that too, right? <laughs> but well, I, you, you can suggest as many things oh, as you okay. want because you're a guest. You, you have a super it's, okay. it's like a limited holiday. Okay. Right? okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that those are ones. And then, of course, you know, for those who just want some really great resource and open resources, go look at GitLab. Like, the, yeah. everything is open there for them. Um, mm -hmm. Have a look at what they state and how they do things. Um, you know, there's more and more information every day on, on also critical topics like compensation. So I think that's, um, yeah, have a look there. Awesome. Uh, so my head is completely blocked, so <laughs> I would only suggest how that is. <laughs> so yeah, this is what I would like to ask. Age, you tell please. Don't go for non-age. It's, uh, it's not good that. How that? How that, yes. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Uh, Sunny, it was a great pleasure having you with us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, because we really did. Very much, yeah, Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, the, the episode will be available on our website, mkirikubela.fm, on YouTube and also all the podcasting platforms. Um, thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>